Our reading this morning is from Nehemiah 3. This is what Holy Scripture says. Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel, and next to him the men of Jericho built, and next to them Zachar the son Imri built. The sons of Hassanah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired. And next to them, Meshalam, the son of Berechiah, son of Meshezabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve their lord. Joadah, the son of Pasia, and Meshalam, the son of Besodiah, repaired the gates of Yeshanah. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. And next to them repaired Malatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Maranathite, the men of Gibeon and Mizpah, the seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of Hariah, goldsmiths repaired. Next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them, Raphiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Haramath, repaired opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hash Hashabaniah, repaired. Melchijah, the son of Haram, and Hashab, the son of Pahath Moab, repaired another section and the tower of the ovens. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halahesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired he and his daughters. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. Yes, that was a very appropriate <laughs> applause. It was quite a passage. Thank you, Grace, for reading that and practicing that. I know that that would have not gone as smoothly as it did without practice. So um, there aren't too many more of those passages left in Nehemiah. So um, most of you are in the clear. So uh, if, if I do ask you to read scripture. But um, as we begin, prepare our hearts to enter into this passage and learn what God has to teach us from this passage. Let's uh, go before him in prayer. Our Father, we come before you and um, we thank you for your word, even chapters that we wonder, what are we going to get out of this? And um, yet we know that your word is profitable. It's good for teaching, reproof, correction. It's God-breathed and it is what we need, what our souls need. So, Teach us today, show us wonderful things from your word, show us how we are to live, and show us Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Now one of the rituals and trials of our educational journey, one of the most dreaded assignments for many of us is the group project. I don't know how exactly it's done today, but from what I remember, teachers don't really tell you how to navigate the dynamics of a group project. They throw you in a group of four and expect kids who have no training in leadership or teamwork to somehow work towards a common goal and to figure it all out. It's truly a trial by fire. Is it any surprise that in the group project, the worst of our natures come out? The people who tend to be controlling or dominating, they take over. The people who tend to be lazy and are happy they're just happy to do nothing and let people do all the work for them. The people tend to isolate themselves. They just do their own portion without any regard for how to collaborate or work as a team. And sadly, we carry many of these unhealthy tendencies into the workplace as well. Some of you who are younger here, you youth, you can ask your parents. Many adults dread team projects for the same exact reasons that you dread group projects at school. And, you know, maybe that's a depressing thought, but hopefully 
we have at some point in life experienced a healthy team. Maybe not in school, but in sports, or in music, or in ministry, and some of you are part of a great team at your workplace, and I'm sure that is wonderful. And there is a real beauty to a good team. It's why we love movies, usually sports movies, where a bunch of misfits, has-beens, and untapped talents learn to work together toward a common goal. There's something inspiring, something that taps deep into our desire to be working side by side with others towards something greater than ourselves. Nehemiah chapter 3 is more than just another list of people. Instead, it presents a beautiful picture of different groups of people working together for the common goal of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And it points to the diversity and the unity that we ought to have as the people of God as we journey together towards the greater city of New Jerusalem. So that's my first point, diversity. As we look at Nehemiah 3, there is incredible diversity in the groups that rebuilt the city walls. Verse 1 begins with the priesthood who built the sheep gate and its surrounding walls. It was called the sheep gate because this was the gate where uh, people would bring their sheep for the sacrifice at the temple. Um, And this was the northeastern portion of the wall. Sheep were uh, brought in through this gate to be sacrificed, and so it makes sense that the priests would rebuild this part of the wall that was significant to them, that had importance for them. Uh, And this is true for other parts of the wall as well. The goldsmiths and the merchants, for example, in verse 32, they rebuild the portion of the wall that would have contained the market for those on the way to the temple where they might have sold their wares. But other parts of the wall may have just been assigned to a group as well. And after verse 1, the account of the rebuilding, if you follow the geography and you look up a map of where all these gates are, it actually continues in a counterclockwise direction around the border of Jerusalem. And as, we, as Grace read for us, next to the priests were the men of Jericho, and then Zakur, and then in verse 3, the sons of Hasana. But notice that these groups are organized in different ways. Priests are a group organized by class, in Jewish society. Men of Jericho are a group organized by region. The sons of Hasna were a group organized by family relationship. And this continues throughout the chapter. We see different classes. There are the priests in verse 1, those related to ro- local rulers in verses 9, 12, 14, 15 through 19, the Levites in verse 17, and the temple servants in verse 26. These are all different strata in Jewish society. And we see different regions. There's people of Jericho, Tekoa, Gibeon, Mizpah. And we see different family groups. This may be the most common group. There are many verses say, there's so-and-so, the son of X. And we know that it's not referring to a single individual working on that portion of the wall, but the whole family that, and that person was the head of the family. We see different occupations. There's goldsmiths and perfumers in verse 8, and merchants in verse 32. We see different genders. Women worked on this wall as we saw in verse 12. There is both diversity within these different groupings and across these different groupings. There's diversity on every level. Nearly every group within the community of, this returned, of these returned exiles is represented in this building effort. Now, it's popular today to emphasize diversity. Over half of the Fortune 500 companies now have a title now have a position called the Chief Diversity Officer. And this emphasis on diversity is in part because companies recognize that different strengths and perspectives of those from different backgrounds can actually enhance and and make the company more effective in its mission. But what's the biblical perspective? The Bible offers something far more profound than just the practical implications of diversity or the cultural prestige of diversity, because there is a cultural prestige these days if you are diverse. There's a beauty to diversity because it reflects who God is. We often emphasize the oneness of God, which we should, but sometimes without an equal emphasis on his threeness. We believe in a Trinitarian God, which means one God in three persons. This is foundational to our theology, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's a concept that's difficult for our minds to grasp and is ultimately a mystery. 
But the truth is that God, God being in three persons means that there is diversity in God himself, even as he is absolutely one. The very definition of unity. We see further in scripture that when God creates humanity in his image, there is diversity. So uh, Genesis 1.27 says this, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The diversity of male and female differences is imaging the diversity of God himself. We don't know exactly how, but it is. Later in, verse, later in Exodus 4.23, God calls the nation of Israel, my son. Just as Adam and Eve were originally meant to image and represent God to the world, so was Israel meant to represent God to the nations in its diversity of thousands and thousands of people. But both Adam and Eve fail, and Israel fails too as God's representative. Only Jesus succeeds as God's true son and the true image of God, And now because of Jesus, the sinful ways that we deal with our natural differences by excluding, by hating, by fighting, those can now be overcome. Jews and Gentiles, different ethnicities and classes can be brought together into one new humanity and one new family, just as Ephesians 2 teaches us. It's why we delight at the vision of Revelation 7 that we read for our call to worship. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. That image, that vision resonates with our hearts because this is a vision of diversity in worship that was always the intent of God. And it reflects God himself who has lived in the joyful community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from all eternity. Just a little over a month ago, fierce snowstorms were pummeling the country. Buffalo was hit especially hard over Christmas weekend. And that Friday, Alexander and Andrea Campagna, a couple in in their 30s and 40s, they were prepared to wait out the blizzard when they heard a knock at their door. A group of 10 South Korean tourists were on their way to Niagara Falls, and they were asking for shovels to dig a van out of, that that had veered off into a ditch. The Campagnas knew that this was a a dangerous storm. In fact, as you know, several people died in the storm, and, then, and they invited them to stay the weekend until the storm passed. The visitors filled the house. They were sleeping on couches, air mattresses, the guest bedroom, and they watched football. They talked. And what really made this story was that the Campanias were fans of Korean food. They had mirin, soy sauce, gochujang, sesame oil, kimchi, a rice cooker, as well as a well-stocked fridge and pantry. So the guests were delighted to cook some of the best Korean food the Campanias had ever eaten, and they got to eat it together. Isn't that wonderful? It's a story of hospitality, but also of diversity. There's something heartwarming about these two groups of complete strangers connecting over a common bond of Korean food. And even those Even those who were welcomed in were able to bless those who had welcomed them in. Each had their role to play in this story. And isn't that what Jesus calls us to do as his body, the church? Too often we limit diversity in the church to race or ethnicity, but we each reflect the image of God uniquely And we bring our experiences, our backgrounds, our personalities, our skills, our spiritual gifts as members of one body, representing Christ to the world, caring for one another as we would for our own body, and carrying out the mission he has given us to bring others into this new family, this new humanity. So encourage one another to use the diverse gifts that God has given us. Avoid favoritism when one type of personality or skill or socioeconomic class or marital status or age or ethnicity is favored above another. Let us communicate in the way that we welcome and the gospel that we proclaim 
that Christ is for all people. Even as we emphasize the goodness of diversity, we should already begin to see that it's not diversity in itself that thrills us, but diversity joined with unity. That brings me to my second point, unity. Nehemiah 3 shows us that there were many different groups that built, but what makes this an inspiring picture is that they were united. Each of these diverse groups was working towards a common goal and a common good. The common goal was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. The common good was for the protection of the city and to restore the glory of God's name. And we can expect that because they were human, there must have been tensions, rivalries, difference of opinions, yet they were able to put aside their differences to work on the wall together. Verse 5 does reveal at least one group that refused to participate, and you might have caught that in our passage. And next to them, the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. The ruling class of the people of Tekoa refused to build, perhaps because Tekoa was close to a region ruled by Geshem, the Arab, who opposed the rebuilding as we saw in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 19. It may have been fear of retaliation that kept these nobles of Tekoa away from the project. But as one commentator points out, verse 5 is the single jarring note which highlights the remarkable amount of unity among the people. To see these diverse groups working in concert is like a world-class class orchestra where all the different instruments from the violins, to the clarinets, to the tubas, to the triangle, they all play in perfect sync, creating a sound that can never be achieved alone. And this is the biblical vision. Nehemiah 3 is a preview of the greater reality that we now live in. The people in their diversity in that day, they rose up and they built together in unity. But this was for something temporary, something local, something focused on the concerns of the Jews in Palestine. Now we, in our greater diversity of every tribe, people, and languages across the globe, we build with an even greater unity because the blood of Jesus has made us right with God and the power of the Spirit brings us together. It is essential that we hold this biblical vision of diversity and unity together. Because if we think about it, unity without diversity is frightening. Imagine uh, we can think of the faceless army of stormtroopers or maybe a disturbing movie plot where, where people in a small town, they all suspiciously look, dress, act, and say the same things. That's frightening. That's scary. That's unity without diversity. Traditional cultures often err on the side of unity as they emphasize conformity to the rules and the norms of the culture. They essentially say, forget about yourself. Forget about you. Individuality is suppressed for community, but it makes the community weaker as individual strengths and gifts are neglected and the harshness of the rules can often harm the individual. But modern cultures, they make the opposite mistake. They err on the side of diversity as they emphasize the individual at the expense of the community. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. They essentially say, it's all about you. But this too harms the community as everyone goes in their own direction or they might climb on top of each other for their own goals. It also harms the individual as they lose a greater sense of purpose. There is an emptiness when you live for yourself. But God offers something better. When we live out the biblical vision of diversity and unity together, rooted in the one God in three persons, we image him as we were always meant to do. Both the individual and the people of God as a whole, they flourish. We use our gifts, our stories, our very selves for what matters most, the cause of Christ, his glory, his name, his gospel, his church, his kingdom. And the world marvels that we live together as a family, as a body. What a witness when there is nothing that would bind us together if not for the gospel that speaks to our deepest problem of sin and gives us the greatest solution, that is Christ. I remember when our brother Kelvin, who is now with the Lord, was in the hospital a couple of years ago. And at that time, I went to go help discharge him and naturally, the nurse wanted to know what relationship 
that I had with him because it didn't make sense. Here was an older black gentleman and a younger Asian guy. I told her I was the pastor at his church, and her eyes got big, and she just said, okay. To me, it was a memorable moment because on an earthly level, I would have no reason to have a relationship with Kelvin, yet the gospel brought us together. Would that people come to King's Church and say, I don't get how you are all in this community together. What's the common thread? I can't figure it out. It's not politics or socioeconomic status or ethnicity or life stage or shared interests. And we would get to answer Christ alone. Christ Jesus is the reason we hold together. Though the diversity of our differences may be great, the one who binds us is far greater. Because of Jesus, we are being brought into the closest possible unity, the unity of God himself. Jesus prays for this unity in John 17 more than once, asking the disciples may be one, even as we, referring to Father, Spirit, and Son, are one. Do you pray for this as Jesus does? Do you work for the unity of the church, forgiving, reconciling, making peace with one another? And are we building together? That brings me to my last point, city. Unity, diversity, city. The people in Nehemiah 3 were rebuilding the city by rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. They were giving shape, protection, identity to the city that they saw as the most important city in the world because this was the city of God. It was a physical and logistical endeavor, but also a deeply spiritual one. That's clear from the beginning of the chapter when it says in verse 1, Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as a tower of the hundred, as far as a tower of Hanano. Consecrate means to set apart something and to declare it holy, since setting apart is the very definition of holiness. It was fitting for the walls of Jerusalem to be set apart and consecrated because this was a city where God had uniquely chosen to, have his, to make his presence known through the temple. By rebuilding the city and consecrating its walls, the returned exiles were looking in faith to the promises of God, promises to rebuild and restore, such as Jeremiah 31, 38, which says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt from the Lord, from the tower of ha Hananel to the, to the corner gate. By seeking to fulfill these promises, the exiles were hoping to remove the shame that had come to their name and to God's name from the destruction of Jerusalem and being brought into the exile. And yet, as we've noted before in the book of Ezra, the restoration and the rebuilding of Jerusalem in this time looks nothing like what was foretold in the prophets. It lacks the glory and the grandeur of the former city and the former temple. And most notably, the city that they rebuilt to protect the temple, it lacked the presence of God. If you guys know your Bible, the glory cloud of God came down when Solomon built the first temple. But that never happened in Ezra and Nehemiah. They could not undo the shame of their own sins through their own effort. The shame of losing the glory of God through their sin and rebellion. There's a famous image in Ezekiel where the glory of God moves outward until it moves outward of the temple and then outward of the city to return no more. But this is not just the problem of those in Nehemiah 3. It's the story of Adam and Eve who tried to be like God and lost the presence of God as they were kicked out of the garden. It's the story of the Tower of Babel the city, the city of man's rebellion and their attempt to once again be like God. It's a sad, tragic history of Jerusalem, which was supposed to be the holy city, yet it too was another Babel as they went after their idols instead of God. And it's our story too, as we attempt to rule our own lives, to build our own kingdoms, to worship the idols of our age and exchanging the glory of God for created things. Like the returned exiles, we too cannot undo the shame of past sins through our own effort. 
We need the glory and presence of God to come to us just as Jesus did when he stepped through the temple. The glory of God had returned. We need the one who became flesh and dwelt among us, who shows us the very glory of God because he is God. We need Jesus to come and restore glory into our lives, to undo the shame of sin as he bore our sin and shame at his death on the cross. For he is the true temple. Through him, we meet with God. More than that, by our union with Christ, we can have an unbroken relationship with God and together be transformed into a place where people come and meet God once again as his church now becomes the temple. And because of Jesus, the story of lost gardens, rebellious cities, and destroyed temples finds its ending in a garden city temple, New Jerusalem. In Revelation 21 and 22, the tree of life that was lost in Eden it reappears, and in this city, it is available to all. And the temple is no longer in the middle of the city, for its temple, in, in Revelation 21, it tells us, for its temple is the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. And did you ever wonder why New Jerusalem is described as a perfect cube? Revelation 21, 16 says, the city lies foursquare, its length as same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, uh, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. This description is not meant to be literal. We're not to be expecting a cube dropping out of the sky. It's meant to be symbolic. But do you know, do you know what symbol it was pointing to? Because in old Jerusalem, at the center of the city, at the center of the temple, is another perfectly cubic structure, the Holy of Holies. Nehemiah 11.1 1 describes the rebuilt city of Jerusalem as the holy city. But in the true holy city of New Jerusalem, God's people live in the unshrouded, unmediated, full presence of God. This is better than Eden. This is better than stepping into the Holy of Holies. The presence of God, which was once separated and veiled, comes to encompass the entire city. This is the city that is yet to come. And so we wait in faith and we build in faith. We answer God's call on us to build a community, a place, a city of God in the city of man, a place where we welcome all peoples to come and see, to come and know this God who invites us into his presence now and the God who's preparing for us a city where we will live in his presence forever. Let's pray together. Our Father, we come before you when we ask that you would allow us to not just be looking at our present lives, our present busyness, everything that consumes our mind and our thoughts, but be looking forward looking into the future, anticipating, waiting, hoping, longing for the new Jerusalem, the place where we will dwell with you forever in the fullness of your presence. And while we do that, may we always be reminded that you have given us a call now to be your people, to be your temple, so help us to do that faithfully, faithfully as your church in this place, in this time. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. We're going to transition directly to the Lord's table this morning as we prepare to take communion together. And this table is a reminder of the gospel. It's a reminder of God's grace to us it's also a reminder of our unity. This is the reason we gather. We gather as the people of God because of the body that was broken, the blood that was shed, and the grace that was given to us. And so as part of reminding ourselves of the unity, unity that we have, the truth that we hold dear, the faith that we confess, let's stand together and read 
the Apostles' Creed together this morning. Read with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And you may be seated. At this time, Tom, would you come forward and help me serve the table? And what we do here at King's Church is that we invite you to come forward uh, in the center aisle, uh, come take the bread and the cup and return to your seats, and, um, and then we'll take it together. And just as a reminder, we invite all of those who have trusted in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you are welcome to this table. Not necessarily because you were good this week or because you feel strong, but because your trust is in Christ. If this is not you, we ask that you remain seated and instead consider that this Jesus is, is he's offering, he's opening his arms, he's welcoming you into his family if you will trust in him. So when you're ready, please come forward. On the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. In the same way also he took the cup, saying, This cup, is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for, the, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you. Let's drink together. And let's pray. 
Father, we are so thank- thankful that you meet us in our weakness with these visible reminders of the gospel, this visible gospel that shows us Christ. And thank you that Christ is present with us as we take and eat this bread and drink this cup by faith. We, we need you. We depend on you. And we need each other. Show us how we can be more a community, more a family, more one body as King's Church. Work in our hearts. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing this final song. the 
service, we invite you to hold out your hands as a sign of receiving the Lord's blessing, the benediction. May the joy and delight of Father, Son, and Spirit, our triune God, who has loved you with an everlasting love, be yours today, and may we be one as he is one. Amen. Go in his peace.